Hello, dear friends. Welcome back to our workshop on Discovering the Inner Mother, Mother Wound book by Bethany Webster. So the air conditioner is on. I'm a little discombobulated. It's been a wild couple of weeks, but I felt the um, pull and the energy to come back. And so I'm going to go ahead and record and my apologies for the sound. And I'm thinking that I'm going to make... Um, at least this one, a free workshop. Uh, so I'm not going to worry so much about the sound and I will try to speak up um, and remember to do so because it is just about to be a thunderstorm and without the AC, I'd be in a little oven here. So just a reminder that, um, you know, these things can bring up a lot of feelings. Please reach out just for support. I'm not a mental health professional. We're going to be slow stitching through the topics um, that I have picked up from this book, but I'm not an expert on it. Um, it's just my thoughts and musings. And I've been sewing as we go along. Um, what I've got so far is uh, I had first the the personal, our own relationship with motherhood, whether that be through a primary caregiver or um, through our relationship with our own children. We've got the cultural, um, which is where I did this little heart. And I'm just patchworking these hearts on. There's You do not need to follow this. You could be just straight stitching on a random sock, if that's what works for you. I haven't finished uh, this one yet, which was the cultural mother wound, which was the last video. And now we're going to come, I'm going to do this last little corner. This is a baby blanket that my grandmother made for me. And that's what I've been working with. So this last one is planetary. So the planetary mother wound, and I will say that this is uh, the one that I probably feel the least connection to. So I'm just going to snip some random scraps and make the shape of a heart as we chit chat. So yeah, I don't know. This one, I don't feel super connected to. Um, I have been involved in and out with climate change activism. Um, actually, my kiddo and I um, had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. at one point with a group called, um, I'm not going to even remember it now, but it was some sort of like, oh, Moms Clean Air Force, um, a group of moms who got together to advocate for policy changes around climate change and um, you know, we went to Washington, D.C. We did that. I worked for a year for our local government um, advocating for, you know, uh, racial justice within the context of climate change and um, acknowledging how climate change affects people of color um, significantly more than it does um the folks who are actually responsible for all of that. So, you know, I've done the whole political side of it. Um, but in terms of seeing it through the lens of the mother wound, I, I don't know, I'm not totally, maybe it's just not clicking for me in the same way that the other more personal ones are. Um, but I did find a few things that I thought would be interesting to share. And either way, you know, it's a jumping off point. So if you're a person that has um, more feelings on this, I can hear my kiddo just came in the house. So I'm going to go ahead and pause us and I'll come right back. All right, my friends, hopefully that worked. Um, it did say resume recording and pause recording. So hopefully this is continued and is not a new recording, but if not, that'll give me the opportunity to learn how to put two recordings together. So my precious 11 year old had just come in um, after a very challenging neighborhood soccer game. And I think this is, 
you know, this is a part of the mother wound. This is, and maybe this is a nice tie-in for the planetary connection. So patriarchy is this, right? We've talked about it throughout this whole time together, that patriarchy is this um, wrestling for power, right? And we see it in how kids feel like they can't just play together. They have to struggle for power and hurt each other or knock each other out um, in order to not be um, the loser. Um, and patriarchy that is, you know, born out of this desire for power. Um, in this case is, um, you know, seeking power over the, do I want to put another one of these little, I have the other one, I think maybe not. Um, the power over the planet and the resources that the planet provides um, relates, this is how Bethany Webster explains it, to these two main goals, comfort and convenience, which I don't know, that just sort of brings to mind, like, if I think about the things that my kiddo seeks out from me, it's often related to comfort, um, you know, he comes to me for, to be comforted when things are difficult, um, but also convenience, interestingly enough, because, um, you know, I have noticed that as I've tried to sort of look at the patterns that I have as a parent, um, my kiddo will often ask for like, oh, can you get me, um, this juice, or can you get me, um, my shoes, or can you get me my socks from upstairs, right, and that's, that's convenience, and often I'm like, well, I think that there's no, like, real obvious reason why I should, you know, go upstairs versus you because now my kiddo's 11 and as big as me and probably more physically able than me at this point um and yet there's that convenience piece um so the fact that the desire for the resources on the planet to give comfort and convenience is actually really interesting and parallel to that mother um, desire. So it's really interesting to me. Where should we put this pink piece? I want a little splash of pink, but I'm not really sure. Kind of an orangey, maybe up here. Yeah, I like that. Um, so, she makes the point in the book that climate change is intimately related to systems of oppression in terms of race and gender. So that certainly is true just in the fact that climate change affects people of color and women and queer people more than it affects um, anyone else. And, um, you know, and poor people people who are um, struggling with financial challenges. Um, so people of color and women and queer people make up the majority of folks who are living in poverty and the, you know, are also the people who um, do most of the care work on the planet, right? Um, most of the caregiving and, um, you know, house, taking care of the house and taking care of the children, taking care of the old people, most of that is done by people of color and women and um, 
queer people. And um, so while these folks are the most affected by climate change, are the most likely to be in poverty, are doing most of the care work, they also have the least political, financial, and land power. So of course, that would tie right in with patriarchy because it's ultimately keeps coming back to this, who has the power, right? So I'm gonna put a few pins in this. I've laid out my little heart. Oops, got a couple of bent pins. Let's see. And then I'm gonna find my embroidery thread and start stitching it down. at the top of this. I like that. I'm going to get some yellow embroidery thread. So within, you know, concepts around um, climate change, there is um, a term that some people use called climate justice. And it sort of addresses or brings to the forefront the fact that climate change is not a we're all in the same boat type of situation. It's uh, affecting all of us uh, really specifically according to how patriarchy and white supremacy and um, ableism and all of these um, things affect all of us. And, um, and that, you know, it's disproportionate. So it's going to affect those who are more uh, affected by patriarchy are gonna be more affected by climate change. Um, and again, see, this doesn't feel, I don't know, it feels drier for me to talk about. Um, I've got a quote here that I found by someone named Catherine Wilkinson, who says, um, climate crisis grows out of a patriarchal system that is also entangled with ra racism, white supremacy, and extractive capitalism. So I think that extractive piece has to do with like taking resources, whether that be people's, uh, you know, bodies and time using them without um, extraction means like you're taking it without paying for it or without, um, caring about how it's affecting the system. So taking people's time, taking people's, you know, <clears throat> energy by having them work long hours and then just taking people's resources. Um, so yeah, I, you know, this one is hard for me because it may, leaves me kind of feeling like powerless and what am I supposed to do? Um, and makes me feel like slow stitching, like how is slow stitching going to help climate change, right? It just starts to feel a little like hopeless and give up type feeling. And although it doesn't seem powerful enough, at the end of the day, I really do believe that um, slow stitching is an opportunity for us to slow down enough from our busy days and our busy thinking and my kiddo is here once again. I'm going to pause. Okay, I am back. So once again, let's hope that this actually uh, is connecting the recording. But, uh, you know, even though it doesn't seem like a lot, slow stitching gives us the time to slow down from our taking care of our kids, tidying up the house, rushing around at work, distracting ourselves with, you know, busyness 
TV, social media, whatever it may be, gives us the time to slow down from that and have a conversation with ourselves. And start to think about how do we feel? And when we have a better understanding about how we feel and we have a better relationship with our own self, we can be more available to not only the people around us that we love, but we can be more available for things like climate change, right? Because if I'm just focused on my my individual story of how, you know, my kid isn't doing what I want my kid to do, or my partner isn't doing what I think they should do, or my parents are A, B, or C, um, or the school is stupid, or the the, my work is crazy, you know, all of the complaints and criticism and gossip that a lot of us focus on in terms of what we spend time thinking about and talking about when we slow down enough to say, how am I feeling and actually show up for those feelings within ourselves, we're going to be far less likely to perpetuate patriarchy within our own relationships, which is that power struggle, Right. And when we're not perpetuating that in our day to day, we're also less likely to align with people who are perpetuating that outside of us. And we'll also have more energy because all of that criticism and gossip and trying to control people that we can't control is very draining and exhausting. And of course we would feel overwhelmed. And when we're able to release those things and people and places and situations that we can't control we can actually show up with more patience and generosity and even just energy to have logical problem solving around things like climate change um and when we start to respect ourselves enough to check in with ourselves it also gets us out of that dependent you know, um, serving the patriarchy mindset. So, so many of us are waiting to be told what to do, waiting for the government to save us. And that is very much how we've been trained by patriarchy to be the <clears throat> little girl that waits for daddy or be the, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, what's the word? Um, not subservient is not the word that they use, but the model uh, in Christianity of the wife, you know, submitting, being the submissive wife and waiting for what our husband's going to tell us to do. When we start to respect ourselves enough to ask ourselves how we are feeling and give ourselves the time to think about our feelings and start to heal some of that and remember that we are divine in the same way that every other human is divine. And when we start to undo that, uh, you know, really lie that we were told that um, we were under uh, a man or under a, a, you know, masculine God and waiting to be allowed to be here or even not even, you know, waiting to have a relationship with that God believing that we don't deserve one because of how we were born and rules around gender and all of that. When we start to get out of that and respect our own self and respect our own power and divinity, we are then able to show up with that assertive spirit and not just that codependent waiting to be told what to do and waiting to please. And <clears throat> that will have the ripple effect in our interactions that we're not driven by that ego, that competition, that control that is so um, intricately woven in with patriarchy, all of those hierarchies. Um, and when we take care of and get to know our own self, we're actually showing up as a full capable person who has something to contribute um, and then we can start talking honestly with the people in our own lives 
And when we start, start talking honestly with each other and give each other permission to have needs and to have um, also the ability to take care of your own needs and we're not doing all this passive aggressive codependent, you know, uh, manipulation of each other, that opens the door to collaboration. And what we really need ultimately for any of these big major planetary changes is collaboration, right? But competition is wired into patriarchy and we can't work together if we're competing against each other. So in a maybe small, but maybe big way, slowing down enough to create a, a solid relationship with yourself, which is what I hope to do by taking this time for quiet contemplative creativity um we open ourselves up to having authentic relationships with others uh instead of coming together to dominate or compete and um at the end of the day I really believe that we're all interconnected in such a way that if we come into wholeness individually, we impact the whole collective and open up more possibility for other people to come into wholeness themselves and then to understand, you know, our true interdependency. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to give us um, just a little chance to think about, let's take a few minutes to think about how <clears throat> what comes up for you just when you first think about climate change or whatever is there any of that powerlessness in it is there any like waiting for a patriarch a government a dad to come save us so take a few minutes to think about that and then we'll do one more contemplation then I'm gonna end us with a poem let's just sh so for a few moments Then as we continue to contemplate how this training that we inherited around patriarchy and white supremacy, how this has impacted our relationship, not only with ourselves and with our mother and our families, um, but with those people that we perceive to be our competitors. Think about how you maybe have a sister or a friend or even someone that you see on TV and how you feel that them doing well threatens you in some way. Where is that competitive desire for power or desire to dominate or be better than living inside of you.
And now let's take a moment to think back over the four categories of how the mother wound affects all of us. The personal, meaning our relationship with our own mothers or primary caregivers. Take a moment to think about that. And then let's think about our relationship with being a mother or a parent and how this experience of being dominated and told that we're less than has affected the way that we interact with ourselves as parents and with our children. And then let's think about the cultural mother wound and how living in this culture that tells us either that we're less than or we have to be more than anybody else and how that has affected us. And as we're going through each of these, just opening up to any grief that's there and feeling free to pause this, to take your time with it, to step away if you need to, to get something to drink, take care of yourself, remind yourself that it's not your fault, that you're not bad for having interacted with. And, and you know, we've all reinforced these systems None of us are apart from that. And letting that, that grief come forward. And as you sow, saying, I hear you, I see you, and I'm going to sit quietly with you, just as you would with a friend who doesn't want you to fix anything, but just wants your presence your loving presence. And then coming to the spiritual mother wound and how your relationship or understanding of divinity, of a higher power, of a God has been impacted by these messages of patriarchy and how that has affected your ability to see the divine within yourself 
and your understanding of oneness and your part in that oneness. Remember to take some big, deep breaths and be really gentle with yourself as we continue on through this. A few quiet moments. And then thinking about the planetary mother wound and thinking about the things that we love in nature and how little there is of these hierarchies, how the trees are not comparing or competing with each other as they reach up towards the sun. And thinking of those people who are affected more by all of these things because of the ways that patriarchy intertwines with race and gender inequality. And sending some love for a few minutes out to those people who are struggling financially, the Black, Indigenous, and people of color who are more affected by patriarchy and climate change and all of these things. Queer and trans people, to people with disabilities, neurodiverse people, That people who are also affected by all of this and our extremely fat phobic society. Women and little girls without rights all over the world. And let's take a moment to send out love to all of those people and to our planet and all of the animals. And now let's take a moment to reach back to our ancestors, all of the mothers and grandmothers and caregivers and queer and trans folks who have led the way and loved and served and led and cared. All of those fighting for racial justice and indigenous justice. And let's send a big thank you to them and our forgiveness where necessary. And if you can't get to forgiveness, at least some compassion to recognize that they were affected by this patriarchy, just like us. And now let's take a quiet moment to think about our descendants 
our children who we already know and love, their children, some of whom, some of us may already know and love grandchildren. To the children of our grandchildren, and all of those who are going to inherit not just our genes, but this planet and the, the system of patriarchy, which has been moving through it for some time. And may we send them a blessing of healing and of understanding and of hope for the possibility of growth and forgiveness and healing. And now let's send some love towards our own heart. Thank ourselves for taking this time to contemplate our feelings as they relate to the concepts of the mother wound. To thank and honor ourselves for creating a quiet time to explore our, our feelings and have a conversation with ourselves and for taking the time to gather these beautiful pieces of fabric, choosing beauty and creation, even in the midst of a lot of destructive forces that can feel really ugly. And remembering that wherever there is destruction, there's also creation. And that those two are a never ending cycle. And as I have a snag here in my own stitching, let us take a moment to have grace for those times in our life when we want to show up with love and compassion, but we get snagged and we fall back into patterns that are more reflective of competition and dominance. Let us remember that we're not here to do anything perfect and that our goal is not to achieve some sort of enlightenment or perfect happiness or perfect peace, but just to, like we do for our little ones when they're crying or scared or confused, we don't want them to be fine. We just want them to know that we're here and that we love them. Mm -hmm. 
And as we finish up here, I'm going to read us a poem that's at the beginning of this book. It's one of uh, my favorite poets, Mary Oliver. If you haven't heard her poems, I really encourage you to go check her out. Her, my favorite one by her is called Wild Geese. Um, so I encourage you to go read that one. Um, but this one is called The Journey. I'm just going to go ahead and read it as we close up here. One day, you finally knew what you had to do and began. So the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice. So the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles. Mend my life, each voice cried, but you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do. Though the wind pried with its stiff fingers, at the very foundations. Though their melancholy was terrible, it was already late, already late enough and a wild night and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds. And there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own. That kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do. Determined to save the only life you could save. Isn't that beautiful? So with that, my dear ones, I am sending you so much love and so much grace and a gentle heart, patient heart, a forgiving heart towards first of all yourself and then letting that ripple out. I'll continue stitching. I hope you do too. And I look forward to seeing you again very soon. So much love.